Growth hack your brand and then destroy anything that moves. You need to grind hustle your platform manifest. It's all about entropy, elegance, and finance. Blockchain. Invest in real estate every day. Invest in real estate every morning. You need to mind hack the mind shackles that are grabbing your mind. Entrepreneurs. 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 Entrepreneur. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a day. Eat the man who just fished and you'll eat for a lifetime. Bartons! Business money hacks. Our arrows will blot out the sun. Uh, um, a certain, due to a court settlement, I'm required to bring the cat in lieu of psychiatric evaluation. Hmm. So I was able to get out of an entire portion of my probation, which would have been 90 days of psychological evaluation in, and in turn have to permanently bring around this cat for the duration of his life. Mm -hmm. So that if ever I feel like doing something which could otherwise have a negative impact, I have to remember, because uh, I don't believe in God, so the idea of God watching is not really in question, but the idea that my cat is watching is a fact. That's powerful, that's yeah. powerful. Welcome to uh, Business Money Hacks. I'm Bridge Stewart. And I'm Dustin Taylor Hahn. And uh, today we're going to be breaching the subject of information and specifically how to control that information and, and how you can control your own information. Confusing information can have a huge impact. If anybody has anything on you, deny. Deny in the face of atrocity, in the face of... <laughs> I like to think of it as like a big fire hydrant. As a public figure, information is constantly just spewing out uh, about you, about your work, about things you're doing behind the scenes. And to be able to clamp down on that, build almost like a, a structure around that fire hydrant of, of spilling information, I think is a very great thing to do. There's something called diffusion of responsibility, which is what I like to use in work that I do. Somebody comes to me and says, like, this was clearly your responsibility. I, mm -hmm. I, I push this off to, on somebody else. I put, uh, this is why I hire several different secretaries who have no family and nobody connected to them. So you have them on retainer. It's like a blank slate. Yeah. Almost them, like it seems like just a, like a like a robot or something working for you. Just a, no background, no past, none of that heavy history. Just, yeah, that's great. I think this segues great into our guest. His name is Spalding O'Henry. Spalding, Sir Spalding. Absolutely. I was about to say, don't, don't you, don't you forget that bridge. I, don't. I, that was my bad. I'm sorry. That's I've earned it. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a sir, yeah. Yes, sir Spalding yes, O'Henry. People always, yeah, that's that's something that often gets dropped, honestly. Um, so I'm, I really am glad you remembered it, because I would have otherwise been quite put off. Uh, is every British person a sir? Is that how that works? Is any British person that I've met has a sir in front? That's a common misconception, right? Mm -hmm. Only Brits who have established themselves as credible members of society in so much as they are achievers. You likely run in sort of elevated company, and so I suspect that's probably coloured somewhat of your, your perceptions. Is there a name for people who aren't sirs? In yes, the absolutely. Community? Although it's Poppers not, it's not used close to a, a popper, actually. It's, it's a pori. If I were to meet, you know, go to my haberdashery or, or what have you, go to my tanner, I would refer to him, uh, to his face, as Pori, Pori Smith, or Pori Harm in your case. And that derives from the word... Uh, poor, poor, to, poor, to not have any money, absolutely. So you could say that those are the individuals that come into my compound who have no name, who have no past, who, who mm -hmm. have no uh, future... I could call them poris oh, instead absolutely. of a blank slated human because they don't want to hear that. That might improve morale. Just calling them calling these people poris because you yeah. are you are identifying them still as a group, and yeah. it's obviously an understanding there implicit that they're still subject to your whim, right? Yeah. But I think it does give you the option. It gives you the ability to connect. And so absolutely, I think if you're getting those blank states into the Colosseum to do whatever it is you're going to do to them, I think it's very important to give them a sense of cohesion before you then pull them apart. Right. I do have this like flashing light that plays at night when they're sleeping. That I'm sure that it, helps. It begins to erode, yeah, erode yeah. their it's a sense yeah. of self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God, that's brilliant. I, we end up going to a lot of veterans' homes and finding some that have particularly yes. bad 
Shell shock, and I have no recollection of who they are, or where they're from, and that's shell shock is the term, the PC term that we're supposed to be using. It. Yes, I believe yeah. that's what the correct term for what was formerly called. Um, I think it was. I, I, I think called, I think it was called war shakes. Yeah, I think it was. The, <laughs> yeah, I believe that's right. Yeah. Is the war, the war shakes, and yeah. so now, but now the term is shell shocked. Is that yeah. that's the PC? That's everything. the PC yeah, term. Yeah. Okay. Um, I preferred war shakes. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, I think I thought war shakes was more accurate, but yeah. I, in any case, I think in World War Two they called it war shakes. Yeah. Absolutely. Not World War Two. The World War Two that is in conventional textbooks, but the the, the real, secret, the real, the real world. world. Yeah, well, we should talk about that as well because I, I do want to get into history. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, for those that don't know, I work for a small, smaller publishing company mm. called uh, called uh, uh, Scrub and Sub Publishing. Mm-hmm. Um, Scrub and Sub. Old Scrub and Sub. Um, so that was actually my my grandfather's Jewish name. Um, mm. Prior to... <laughs> <laughs> what was his first name? Uh, his first name was Emilio. Emilio. Emilio Scrub and Scrub. And Scrub. <laughs> wow. I mean, he probably had a couple problems when he came to Britain. I mean, oh, right. A absolutely. name like that. Yeah, because of the in Britain, they didn't like Italians. Was he Jewish and Italian? He was Jewish-Italian. Right. Absolutely. Double whammy yeah, Britain, exactly. Emilio so, Scrub and Sub. Obviously, I feel a lot of pride about how far my family's come. Um, uh, so you said you had a small publishing company, but I see, I, I see yeah, everywhere. I was being sort of hyperbolically humble. It's You're obviously like a major a horror. That classic British wit from from Sir Spalding. Oh, <laughs> ah, you know, I'm just, what, what, I, what can I say? Um, no, so yeah, it's actually a pretty major media conglomerate, and we own a number of important news channels, uh, newspapers, and uh, but I'm the youngest of three brothers, so it wasn't sort of me who was going to ascend to the throne initially and I was sort of pushed relegated to the side in, in publishing but that's where I really honed the skills that would eventually allow me to take complete control of the company yeah so I, I'd imagine with three brothers there's probably a lot of you know fighting and, and sort of joshing and, and clawing ultimately it's all in the family so you know when I for, like when I killed Tim's wife that was something that was like, damn it, you spoiling, you son of a bitch. How, you know, that sort of like, we, we, it's a tit for tat sort of relationship. But yeah. I think when I took ultimate control of the company by, uh, well, let's just say by uh, making sure my brothers were uh, rightfully prosecuted for some uh, certain fraudulent crimes that they certainly committed, if you understand yeah. my meaning. Yeah, legally speaking, yes. yes. Legally speaking. So Th- This obviously ties into our concept of information. And you are a man who controls information, how we're received by the media. You run the media. Yeah, <laughs> Especially no. in third world countries. Yeah, I've seen scrub and sub newspapers all over the floors. Oh, absolutely. And oh, yeah. uses toilet paper. And- I think that's where we do some of our best work, honestly, because mm-hmm. the, the state-run news in those countries is incredibly easy to take control of. You know, there's, they have very little in way of anti-corruption regulation in place. So it's exceptionally easy to take command of sort of a bureaucratic system because information absolutely is the, uh, the foundation of, of business. I mean, if you don't have all the information, then you have to make it up. Mm-hmm. And you have to be sure to make up information that the people you're selling to will find compelling, Right. So I think that's it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. That's that's such a great way to approach media. I feel like everybody these days is getting so wrapped up. I mean, I don't want to say fake news, but yeah, people keep talking about fake news. There people is. keep talking about what uh, is reality, what is fiction, what is uh, truth, what is fact. I, it's it. We're all just telling stories at the end of the day. The details. Who, who cares? People yeah. want the story. Look something the, salacious, something, you know. Boring. Sexy. You want it to be sexy. Sexy. You know, sexy. You bloody. Bloody, you know, that's exactly it, right? Nobody wants to hear you know, somebody raised a lot of money to fix some sort of, uh, oh, some sort of a uh, problem with people's uh, tinnitus or, uh, you know, whatever the, the new thing is. No, absolutely no. You want to spin it so it's the things that are exciting, right? So, I remember and that's how you control government. Oh, absolutely. I think for to control a government, you have to be sexier than your opponent, right? And your opponent is, is just real governance. So it's not that hard you know, to be <laughs> yeah. sexier than that, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Keeping things in order, uh, 
Uh, who, who needs order yeah, when you can have chaos, chaos. mass chaos? Yeah, there's nothing nothing sexier than a bunch of chaos. You yeah, know, that's know. that's yes. hot. I know. I get honestly. I get I, when I think about that sort of stuff about how tumultuous a situation is. Mm. I mean, that's what really that's what gets me going. You know, and that's why I think I think stories are a great way to really just upend the table mm. in your favor. Right. Something, something you mentioned earlier is you don't believe in... I think this was before. You don't believe in God. No. No, no I do not. I like to believe that there's a God who, who wants to create chaos on this planet because it's, it's fun to watch mm-hmm. people fight each other and, and, and get sick. I and mean, when I'm looking at my Coliseum, I say, the sick kid, you know, with one leg, you know, how's he going to win? How's he going to win this situation? Nine times out of ten, he gets run over by a wheel. Yeah. I wish I could believe in a God like that. You know, I really, when you, when you say that and describe that, I think I, there's a part of me that would love to believe that that God of chaos was out there, mm. you know, uh, really guiding us to, into the sort of the chaotic abyss. But I just don't, I don't see a lot of evidence for it, unfortunately. So I think, I, I think ultimately we as human beings, though, I think I sort of have a humanist perspective that mm. it's, it's up to us to engender the chaos that we so desire. I think it's up to us. Believe me, I, I wish I yeah. could. I just think that kind of God of chaos is a crutch, honestly. We're built in, in God's image, a God of chaos, a God who creates strife and, and destruction. Like I, this is, These are the feelings that I have all, every day, every moment of every day. So I want to prove to that God I will become a God myself. No, and that's beautiful. And that's, I mean, that's beautiful. Yeah, that is an interesting subject. Because me, I'm, I am a deeply religious uh, Lutheran. And uh, I follow the way of Jesus Christ uh, to the fullest, hmm. to an extreme, I would say. Uh, I believe the resurrection is coming very soon. I think it's through that chaos uh, that Jesus Christ will be reborn uh, through, uh, I believe, a technological way, a rebirth of humanity. Mm-hmm. I call him Silicon Jesus, this rising tide of a techno Babylonia, if you will, that, that will encompass the earth and um, the sinners will be washed away. And uh, I think that will be coming very, very soon. But right here, you see so many interpretations of truth. Mm-hmm. And to me, that just speaks to the way in which we can all con- control the narrative. You know, that's something that's up to all of us. I can't tell you how many... When I was younger, I would take on a, as editor a lot of the biographies we would be working on at the publishing house. And I can't tell you how many of these I would just really dive into and alter and change. I mean, details that people wouldn't even think are relevant, right? At one point, I remember I was doing, I remember I was doing Henry Kissinger's biography and he mentioned a childhood crush of his named Abigail. And I thought, no, the girl's name was Tonya. And I changed it. And it's those little, those little details. People, that's people, great. people think it's like, oh, I'm, I, it's all these big episodes. And, I, and that's true. But it's also just these little, you know, that's not her name. It's not Abigail. It's Tonya. And now, in that way, you are becoming a god, right? Abigail is gone. She never was. And in her place is Tonya. You took it away. You, I, and, that, and you've added to the story. You're exactly. telling your story exactly. the way you want it to. Exactly. Tell it. Because I fucked a Tonya when I was in ninth grade. And that... That's personal to you, and now it's personal and to the And now it's Henry Kissinger's world. story, and it's everyone's story. Exactly. Hmm. Great. Is you're... there a lot more of you in the Henry Kissinger story? Did you add more of I, your, I think your there's experience? bits of me in all of the stories I've worked on. Yeah, all the biographies and the fictions. I think, those, I think, my, I, think I come through hmm. uh, in all of them. You know, for example, the character of, of, of Boris Bumbridge in the acclaimed children's novel Over Red Riding Hill... Hmm. Um, was entirely based on me. Of, of I wanted to make sure that the story had a character that reflected my view of the world rather than the author's, which was explicitly optimistic and explicitly about the power of friendship. I mm. was like, that's interesting, great, yeah. children. That's yeah. interesting, you know, kind of a snore fest. But, but let's like throw that. in a powerful playboy character by the name of Bumbridge who really dominates the story. Sexes it up. He's Sexes a nihilist. it up, you know, exactly. And lives just right across from Red Riding Hill and therefore, you know, has this big impact on the story. Mm. And people don't realize that. And one of the most beloved characters from the story was actually something I just added in. Wow. And now that's becoming a feature <clears throat> film. A feature or film, or absolutely. A series of yeah, films. No, exactly. That's it's a feature great. of films. It was very exciting. I believe, um, 
I believe right now we have Eric Bana attached to play my role, which I'm not too thrilled with. But um, here we get Sean Bean. Oh, Sean I, Bean would be great. That's what I thought as well. Yeah, no. Well, you know, um, uh, Sean Bean. Uh, you do you know? I don't know if maybe you don't. Is that he actually? Um, he's what. His what? name is spelled S E A N B E A N. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah, people don't realize this. They assume it's an it's the S H A U N B H A U N U N, and it's it's the E A vowel connection for both for both words. Yeah, it's very strange. I think his family is actually connected to the bean industry. They sort of just altered their name so that they could be associated with their product, and again. Again, a great way to control information, control your legacy. And a name is so important because it, it's, it's all you have. And so you need to be able to make sure that you have complete power over it, how to take it and own it and have it become what you want it to be versus whatever it is. Mm. Well, one thing that I happen to think gets a little too reported on is issues regarding legality with mm. publicly right. traded companies. Right. I think... That's, it's a lot of information out there. Right. And, and uh, it just seems to always get reported on in the Wall Street Journal. And, oh, okay, we have this much money or we've lost this much money. It just seems like that's a little too much information mm, that shouldn't even be out there. Who cares? Exactly. That's personal information, what, what, what my publicly traded company is worth. Like, that's not something for everyone to know, obviously. They have no right. They have no right to that. What I found is most effective in those scenarios is just to, to make up numbers, honestly. Uh -huh. For our conglomerate, we just, we make up whatever numbers we want. You just make them up. We make them up, honestly. No one's going to look into well, it. Well, that's the thing, is, is if they do look into it, then we make up more numbers. And we make up more numbers. Throw numbers we, keep, we keep throwing numbers. What, is, what, <laughs> what, what, what number would you, like if I said, hey, I heard your family worked with Nazis. Absolutely, 40. I don't know what to say now. 67, 88, 33, and you show them on the on, on charts. You have paperwork ready for that, and you look, and it's there's just a chart, numbers and, and, and the numbers, it's and, numbers and charts, and, and then you look at the charts, and eventually it all becomes obscured, and it's not really clear. It's like, well, look at this. Is it? it did I understand this correctly? It was maybe I was off with the the Nazi money? Who know? It suddenly it becomes a, a, a big pool. And, Wait, you know, you were funneling money through the Cayman Islands. Seven. But you seven exactly, and they're sitting there thinking, "What don't I know? What, oh God, it means something, and I don't know what." Right? Mm -hmm. So they're panicking. They're suddenly they, you see the sweat start dripping down their faces. You throw out numbers. What are we talking about? I'm supposed to know, aren't I? Because he's just throwing out the numbers like I'm supposed to know. Mm -hmm. So clearly he has a retort that I don't totally understand. Confusing. I call it peeing in the pool. Well, peeing in the pool because the pool. because when you pee in the pool. There's so much else in there. Yeah, it's immediately diffused. You, you, no one knows. So the pool is information. Is information, and you have to make sure all of your pee is going into the pool. You don't want it going into a little cup where someone can look at that. You know, look at your pee. You have to go right in the pool, and it's gone. So I want to go back to controlling history or telling history, telling your stories. You create textbooks for children all around the world, especially in America, and uh, a lot of people are angry about the textbooks that you're producing and that are being taught in schools right now. Uh, First of all, there's numbers all over the, the, the book, but there's a lot of information that I used to believe was true, and now I find out that... Yeah, now we've got these truthies coming out here, trying to debunk sort of what we've been, been printing for a while now. Disgusting. Honestly, that's probably been one of the biggest challenges we've faced, is sort of this pushback we've received. Up until very recently, it wasn't possible for someone to fact-check us on the existence or non-existence of the Dakotas. So now people realize it's not states. Those states don't exist. There's no, that, that space on the map no, is, not, is not a real space, That's right? right? <laughs> exactly. And no, and, no one ha and no one has, exactly, because they're not real. But we had insisted that they were. And so in the digital age, people have been able to push back in that regard. Uh, I want to know more about the real World War II. And that's the big, that's, that's, that's one people, yeah. Eventually is World War III and we're looking forward to a, a World War IV. And no, exactly. As a lot of people don't realize that there have been more wo world wars than people were initially aware of, obviously. Uh, number two is in fact the third, right? So that big three that you're looking forward to would in fact be the fourth. Uh, most of it was actually fought in the area around what would today be Mongolia is actually where the majority of the war was actually conducted. Uh, the Germans were, weren't involved in... The Not involved at all, actually. Um, the Germans I assume were the Mongols were 
and violence. Exactly. No, it was a continuation of sort of a thousand years of Mongol terror. And a lot of people don't realise that that's sort of been flipped on its head a little bit and made to, uh, made to implicate the Germans and the Japanese, mm. um, who were both completely, completely innocent. So do you guys see what I've just done there? Did well, you catch what I just did? What? Sir Spalding? Exactly. None of that was necessarily true, oh. right? I, did you see, did you catch what I just did there? I will handle it. But the two, <laughs> so right? When you print it, that would become fact. If I had printed, if that's what we had printed in the history books, that's what would now be being disputed, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's that that sort of the, the game. It's isn't the it? game right there. You just made up a war. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just, and and, and you said the you, Germans and the Japanese were faultless. And that would, and suddenly that would have been history. Like yeah. I don't know what to believe. Right in there, that. <laughs> exactly. And that's ultimately our goal, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not about getting them to believe one thing or getting them to believe another. It's about confusing, obscuring the whole process to the point where it's great. I don't know what to believe anymore. Well, I guess I'll just eat my Cheerios and shut the hell up. You know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah, you see, and now you're catching on. you said today is, 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 has any shred of honesty, and I love it. Yeah, yeah so... so uh, is that a real... Are you British? <laughs> like, what is, yeah. Did what you is just it? break in yeah. here? Like, are you just some guy off the street? <laughs> 14, 88, <laughs> 6, 33. And Matt's peeing in the pool right there. Uh, I'm covered in urine right now and that uh, I feel great about it well and it's such a pleasure to piss all over you guys I mean for me I I think people don't understand the significance of a lot of these topics I think the the necessity for controlling information in business once you understand that then then you can begin to control and craft your own story Um, you know whether what you're doing is legal illegal Mm. these are the things that proper story control really allows you to to manage well Sir Spaulding thank you Thank you so much for pissing yeah. all over us. You really pissed all over My us. I would love to get a sample of, of your urine. Yeah. Just to just to have. You know? 